Welcome back. Uh, this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, our, our third focus, um, or third tranche, tranche um, of the day. And uh, at two o'clock, we are um, having, um, going back to the system of care for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, but I thought that at least for a, a few bits, we could um, have a bit of a discussion on what we heard this morning um, as it related to opioid overdose crisis response and what things um, struck us that we want to might want to get some more information on or pursue and um, what things we're going to put off to another day. That, that, that they're, they're not directed at what we need, want to do right now quickly. Yeah. Well, I think the one thing that I heard was around access to, um, uh, what, not Suboxone, not Suboxone, sorry. Methadone. Methadone, thank you. Um, and, you know, we heard from, uh, that it's spread out around the state, but I'd be interested to hear more about access in rural areas and barriers to treatment in more rural parts of the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that um, it's easy to look, I mean, their, their focus, our witnesses focus was really looking at Burlington and more where there's access to County. transportation and I'd just be more yeah. interested in um, access or barriers for rural Vermont right? and what that looks like and what we can maybe help along that. That van idea. The van yeah. idea. The van idea. Um, um, because that's not that's not brick and mortar. It's not creating um, something new, in, you know, which will take lots of time. But perhaps an existing provider could do a van. Um, yeah. I think it also opens up a, a question that I think might be worth exploring along those lines is that there are mobile syringe exchange services. There may be some regulatory reason that we can't combine those two, but I think it's just worth asking the question. If we're having these vans going out for one purpose, is there a way to kind of equip them for another? Okay. Um, and we don't need more vans. <laughs> And then, what are you on transportation? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Should we have it be elected? <laughs> um, how about the remove all prior authorization? It seems like do do we need to hear from? Is that an insur insurance company that has that? And how do we help in that um, area? I'm not. I mean, I think we would need to hear from insurance. Um, the other thing might be. Um, to hear from Diva as it relates to, because um, probably um, um, heroin and opioid um, disorder is not solely with people who are receiving Medicaid, but that might be a um, the first step um, in terms of uh, looking at. Um, Looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think another one would be the taking a look at the sunset on buprenorphine, uh, removing criminal penalties. I know that part of that work was we, um, the chief prevention officer doing a bit of an analysis of how that's going. So maybe we could hear back from Ms. Hutt about, about that. What is the sunset? I mean, uh, what, what um, does it have? The bill that we remember the bill we passed. I think I think it's a two year sunset, and um, there was supposed to be a review. Right. And um, that was added in the Senate, I believe. Yes, it was added. It was not in the House passed bill. Um, the Senate added it, and in the interests of of not having a stalemate, we said okay. Um. So what, yeah. Um, I also would be interested in um, access to treatment at hospitals. If someone goes to the ER um, 
Is there any, like, do all of the hospitals in Vermont emergency room have someone who can prescribe Suboxone immediately? And building on that, it, what was concerning is about the preferred provider network and how we're not currently able to add any more preferred providers to expand access. Um, so I don't know why that is, but awesome. I think that could also tie yeah. into making sure that in ERs and hospitals across the state, we'd have easier access. Yeah. Um, and of course, I would love to look into the legislative barriers to overdose prevention sites, um, not necessarily putting the funding in per se or, or opening one on the state level, but um, maybe not being a barrier to municipalities that are looking to do such a thing. So what, what barrier were you looking for? Well, I think from testimony, what we heard is that there's kind of two pathways that we could go. One is saying, you can open it and we're not gonna prosecute you for opening an overdose prevention site. And the other is uh, granting municipalities the opportunity for them to decide if they would like to open an overdose prevention site. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Also the access to the methadone clinic state. This seems like something that might be reasonably easy, which is the hours of operation not being um, for people who need who work so evenings and weekends is that the, the, the the challenge, <laughs> I mean that's what you were, the, the challenge with that is that the methadone clinics are not state clinics the methadone the methadone oh, yeah. um, um, <clears throat> clinics um, or the hubs are run by community mental health centers who um, we don't tell community mental health centers how off how how many hours they need to be open or things like that. We potentially, and and I mean, we potentially could, could put money in to be directed towards increasing the hours. And then someone would come to our door and say, we can't even staff the hours that we have now. So there is a part of me that doesn't want to put something into place that that we can't do that, that that's that doesn't work right now a good thing to think about later because it is sort of amazing or even if they could switch their hours to hours that make sense for everyone not just people are available in the daytime during the week but yeah oh, I, that's yeah goes yeah. back to that buzzword workforce and getting folks. But I, I think that's what, that's what Dane's fixing down in commerce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well I think that comes back to the same thing with that we see with a lot of workforce, just remembering that when we do Medicaid rate increases to include the preferred provider network, because that includes hubs. So if there's staffing issues at hubs, those rates are determined by Medicaid rates for the preferred provider network. <laughs> Um, I and I left before the end, but I heard some the the issue of the availability of fentanyl patches or something. Yeah, we kind of yeah. talked about yeah. that. Yeah, I we talked about it later. We kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on that. <laughs> um, we think it's just a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's something that we can do in this bill with regard okay. to that. Um, there are um, hurdles that would need to be overcome in order to do that. Um, I think it is something for us to continue to investigate it. So there might be language about investigating the use of fentanyl patches for, you know. Oh, yeah. I it's, trying to, it's trying to onboard people into um uh into mat essentially trying trying to well you, uh, you, you on some level i think the word is titrate them into it yeah it's a more regulated <clears throat> amount of fentanyl so then you know when it ends it so then they can put them onto buprenorphine and not have that overwhelming reaction yeah but it's an off-label use so, okay it's an off-label it's an off-label use mm -hmm. so that's so that's, that's where we get into cut. that Wishy washy. Oh, okay. Because they're for pain relief. I mean, that's what. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. are, are we the only committee? Yes, we are the only. We are doing this. We are the only I committee. Didn't know if there was... No. <laughs> this, this is this is our job. Yep. 
How about they also talked about the harm reduction centers and that more dollars to help in that area. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Harm reduction. Just to speak a bit, it's sort of I think the prior authorization is sort of like an, seems like something that other states are doing. Um, a barrier that we could look into uh, yes. removing. Um, I think there are so many other uh, things that were kind of mentioned between, uh, you know, access to methadone and that being staffing syringe, syringe service providers, opening up the preferred provider network, uh, like safe induction, which is the low barrier treatment. And I imagine that all of those include some investment, yes, some need for investment. Yes. And so maybe kind of trying to get a sense of where can that investment go the furthest right now, or where is something that, that's where my mind is, is going. Proper. Uh, uh, uh. Proper. I can't see you, but I see your hand. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> you have a hand up. Your hand's up. No, I know. I, I I had it up for a long while, and I I just uh, turned it off. I'm listening. Oh, okay. I so um, I wasn't ignoring you. No, forget it. I, I, okay, okay, good. Um, I was too busy looking at my piece of paper to um, mm -hmm. to look up at the screen, and yeah, so it turns. Well, it's, I'll tell you what it sounds like from this end. What? Like free for all. Brain I to get in it, I can't. So that's my problem, and I'll, I'll just listen. It sounds like a free for all. Right? Yes, oh, yeah, it is. It is sort of a brainstorming. Like, what do people get out of the testimony this morning that we might want to pursue short term? Um, and it sounds like there's some things that um, aren't for today. Um, and one of, and whether we want to, I mean, one of the things I heard them say was review the hub and spoke system. And um, so we're not going to review the hub and, hub and spoke system model here. Um, maybe put something in there to have that be. And there may be, I mean, I know that there has been some in the past some reviews, both academic and otherwise, of the hub and spoke. Uh, it's time for an, another review, but not to do the review for this, but to say, come back for next year um, or something. Um, I think what he's trying to allude to is that the ideas are bouncing so fast that if you're not right here, it's hard to follow along. Oh, thank you. You know, it, so in other words, maybe this is a time for us to slow down when we talk, be clear, enunciate, pronunciate, so that people online can hear. Um, I'm right here, and it's hard for me to. You guys are going so fast. That okay, thank you, thank you for that feedback. Um, I, of course, this is through my eyes, so. Uh, you all can say now. What about this? One of the things that strikes me as intriguing and maybe can address access to treatment quickly is the concept of a mobile van. And so that would be one, some funding. Um, and two, a question to ask is, can that be connected to what is happening already about mobile distribution of syringes. Um, a second thing that I heard was <clears throat> removal of prior, prior authorization, or at least at minimum, raise it above to 24 or something like that, which is what, and so the question that we would need to get some answer to is, um, because we heard that New Hampshire and Maine and Oregon, but Oregon's far away. So um, New Hampshire and Maine, our neighbors, don't have it at the same level. So how do we perhaps be consistent with that? So 
the information we would need to know is um, how might how might removal of prior authorization or 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 raising of the dosage? I guess I think we would have to work with Diva um, um, in terms of the Medicaid population, um, and um, if we are curious, someone could we could talk with. Um, an insurer in terms of private insurers. Um, I'm forgetting who their lobbyist is, but to put out a little um, inquiry. Sarah, um, teach out from the cross, mm -hmm. if you can do that. Um, or whether to, you know, we might decide to just, if we, if we go down that, to limit it to Medicaid for the first step. Um, there's the, an, yes, Topper. Madam Chair, do we know why pre-authorization is there in the first place? Um, no, I think it's because um, it is a... Maybe, maybe we want to find out why it's there. Okay. There's a, okay, there's so a reason the for it. I don't know myself what it is, but... I've just I been we may actually have an answer. Okay. Um, we. Um, <laughs> The researcher in the room. <laughs> the, the, the researcher in the room who's um, on, you know, as a teacher, I go, excuse me, aren't you paying attention? I am. I mean, so well that I even. I need you to rewind. What was the very last thing Topper said? Like the last part of his sentence? Why do Why are prior authorization? Why do they exist in the first place? I know, but he said something after that. Oh, did you say, what did you say after that, Topper? Maybe we ought to find out why it's there. Yes. Topper was something else. Yeah. around. And it's because buprenorphine is a, a schedule three narcotic as it's classified. Um, so with any narcotics there are typically prior authorizations and they have it for various medications out there. Uh, um, and I think, um, and Tapper, it's a question to ask Diva when we sort of ask about um, what your, how open they would be to changing the level. The question, first question you're very right to ask is why is it there in the first place? Um, and we, I wanna say we, we know in quotes that um, there is some state flexibility given the fact that our neighbors, um, New Hampshire and Maine have either have removed it or it's a higher level. So it doesn't seem like there's a federal barrier. With a lot of this stuff, the federal laws are going to limit things. Um, appreciate the addition, uh, Topper. Um, the, the, the sun, to remove the sunset for the um, non- it was not decriminalization. It was, we called it something different. Um, the non, what we passed last the year. Bill. The Buke yeah. Bill. The yeah. Buke Bill. That's how I remember. You know, um, removing criminal penalties. Removing, um, to, um, to remove the sunset from that. Um, and a question would be to Monica, where she is in her evaluation. Um, would be one thing, and another might be to um, ask um, a state's attorney or a local um, police officer um, <clears throat> what their thoughts would be. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me that they brought up um, was about the need for a lot more attention placed on re-entry for people from the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And the reason it struck me so much is because of the significant number of deaths in from the women's correctional facility last year when people were, during COVID, they were, people were discharged or whatever the term is there. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember the exact number, but it was more than a handful of people died almost immediately mm -hmm. from overdose as a result of, um, it's sad. I mean, it makes yeah. me feel sad that there was nothing on re-entry for them. So they, the focus that they 
talked about on reentry, it seems very important as well. Burlington has been working on that piece just for that area. So it would be nice to be able to help the rural areas as well. When the, the Burlington piece that they're working on, they have beginnings they did i mean i think this is a conversation we would need to have because at the time perhaps before this additional um testimony we had um that was a, a, a one of the multitude of requests that came in as it related to recovery centers and the decision was made at the time not to separate it out. And I don't know if you want to say what was going into your reasoning and whether um, then if we think about it in a different way now. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd really love to put the time into it, um, whether it's during this bill or um, I think that from what I heard, um, and I did speak to uh, Thomas Dalton, who uh, our witness today mentioned, um, I think there were some concerns uh, with the fact that it would be a uh, essentially a second recovery center. And I think there are efforts put to try to collaborate and kind of uh, intertwine their work. And, and there's real difficulty in finding a way to have those two organizations mesh. So I think that's just something that would need to be, um, be addressed. Um, I know that there were concerns from a few parties about sort of a, um, a second recovery center specifically for this purpose, purpose as opposed to something that's more integrated i was just um struck by the comment about um i i know in this body we worked actually quite hard um a couple of years back to ensure that people in the correctional system had access to mat and then uh, so if you have access and then you begin mat while you're in and then all of a sudden you right. don't have it needs to be immediate, you know, it, it can't be like in 24 hours or 48 mm -hmm. hours. It needs to be immediate access to that support on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like what that's a, it's a discharge, yeah, I mean, I think it's something it's to think about. Planning. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's like discharge planning. So when someone's leaving incarceration, what's the planning? Procedure? Exactly. Um, the, and I do believe that that work is happening out of the Turning Point Center in Rutland as well. So some of that's happening there. Some of that's happening through the Vermont, I think it's Criminal Justice Council, whatever Thomas Dalton's organization is. So maybe to hear from both of them as far as what. Or talk to both of them, because I think that there is something unique about individuals who are coming out of a correctional center mm -hmm. and who um, and th their comfort level in terms of who they are interacting with. And then um, the comfort level of others to use the recovery centers if mm -hmm what they perceive is that there are lots of people who have just come out of jail. Mm -hmm. Like it or not, there is a, um, I think some, some hesitation or some perceptions of if you've been in jail, what that means. Um, that so it might be, um, but to, um, to talk to people, um, this is all, I, I, I wanna be clear what we're, um, this testimony that we're doing will be individual conversations, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. So um, to come back and get information and then have some, you know, as we, as we then correct, you know, have something on paper, we can have people come in and, and do take a page out of your process, which was to, which was to, once the bill was developed to send it to all the interested parties. Um, yes, and, and in thinking about this particular area, it is something we could also ask the yeah. Joint Justice Oversight Committee to add to their work plan this summer um, in terms of taking, because it's a complicated, it's a complicated process and there's lots of layers um, involved with it mm -hmm. um, that we probably won't have sufficient time to unravel here, but um, just, um, you know, thought. 
Okay. Um, but so, so I think a, a to do task is around, for lack of a better term, the Tom Dalton proposal, um, which was referenced by uh, one of the um, witnesses today, and to have further conversation with the people who are concerned, what their concerns are, and. Um, so the Dalton recommendation was what more specifically? Uh, a recovery center specific for justice involved people in recovery. Thank you. We also heard something about places for safe induction for seven to 10 days. Are there no places like that now, or is this an expand? So this is a new program or an expansion of a current? Um, they're they're not they're not legally allowed in Vermont. Oh, so it would be new. Um, there are some <laughs> across the country, and I think there may be some federal issues. Are there federal issues? I'm looking to you around. Yes. I do not have that answer, actually. Okay. <laughs> Where's my <laughs> research? Um, uh, but there are there are currently legal barriers to doing that. To doing that, because a um, it, 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 it different level, different line, but um, it would it basically would mean decriminalizing or removing the criminal penalties for places where not only could someone who was um, get a clean needle, but they in fact could um, should, should, should could, could on their own in a safe place with a clean needle with someone there if they were to um, overdose. Um, and uh, the there is some beginning research. Some of the, there, my understanding is that there's some, like lots of things, there's some things that have been happening, let's say outside the, outside the eyes of the law, um, outside the formal, let's say the formal process. And, um, but those have been researched. And so we have some research about how effective they are. And I want to say, is it New York City is New York City has one and I want to say somewhere in Pennsylvania or something like that. There's a by, you know, I want to say New Jersey or so there. I think there's more than in terms of the East Coast, there are some communities who have said we don't want to have people dying on the street. And um, so bottom line, this is to prevent death and it would be in a place where Maybe, you know, <clears throat> there will be people there who are respected or seem safe to um, the um, IV drug user who may then be able to, the goal is to direct them to treatment. Um, those kinds of things. Um, but so, I mean, I, I want to help. At a minimum, I'd like to have us have a report on it. At um, at a maximum, what you know is there something? There's, there, I understand that Burlington wants to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and right. that the mayor wants to do it, and that the city council wants to do it. And I don't know why they can't do it. Well, they said it was something that we had to take care of. Well, I know, but so, <laughs> I don't, what is, so, right, so what is the something that one we have to take care of? That we would promise not to prosecute. Prosecute is one of the things. Yeah. We would have, it, it's either a promise someone that we there. don't prosecute them. Not that they, not with someone dying there. It's because people are using drugs in right. the but location. Did also say that what if someone died there, they need to check to see if they have insurance for that? It was a great question <laughs> from Carl on the piece of, well, what's the liability piece? Who's liable if someone does die? And they came back to the piece of, well, we've seen these internationally around the world and there have been zero reported deaths right. in any overdose prevention site 
in the world to date. So not that it can't happen, yeah. but that the liability question is still out there and one that the mm -hmm. city is willing to grapple with. So um, the, the witnesses said that there's a couple of different options. Mm -hmm. You can instruct the Department of Health to develop rules um, around the development and safe use of uh, an OPS, or uh, you could, we could uh, uh, authorize municipalities to be the decision makers with regard to uh, the establishment of them in their boundaries. <laughs> they clear it, clearly had done some thought about that, <laughs> about um, what other um, okay. what have what has happened in other places and stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's. Um, the problem is that we, since we are such a litigious society, that even though people are going there for their protection, if something happened, the family of that person may go after the people running the center. So, I mean, that, that's one of the, the big issues. I mean, even though the intent on, by all of us is to do something that's going to help these people that may <coughs> OD if they weren't in that facility or whatever. Yeah. But that's a thorny issue. Because, I mean, how do you go ahead and protect mm -hmm. people from themselves, really, when it comes down to it? Mm -hmm. right? but, uh, but also from the families of those people, mm -hmm. the people that are offering the service. And there's also the question that if you were to give <laughs> municipalities the ability to do that, um, how long would it take them to basically get through the whole process of permitting and having some sort of a, um, that's outside this committee, because yeah. it might take two years. That's why I kind of liked the, if all we have to do is remove the roadblocks and you are yeah. doing the thing, right? And you figure, I, I think the big question on it is liability. Right. Who's li making sure that we are not creating liability for the state. So we ask the um, attorney general? So I want to say, sort of like um, cannabis disp uh, yeah. dispensaries or whatever they are. Um, we're allowed, state, uh, cities get to choose. Correct. We're not saying everyone has to do this. Mm -hmm. Cities get to choose and they're choosing by voting or whatever. Okay. Um. Okay, um, so uh, who who wants to? Um, this is called divide and conquer mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, in terms of the various questions. Um, Dane, is there a question or two that you are most interested in? Um, doing a, some more conversations. I'm I'm interested to hear what other people are interested in. I okay. suppose, yeah, and then see what's see what's left. Okay. Yeah. You already know what mine is. Um, I think. Self self um, safe injection sites. Oh. Yeah. Would you like to explore that? If you would like me to, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to. Okay. <laughs> um, realizing that there are three options. Mm -hmm. Study. <laughs> Which we're not doing report. studies. Report. <laughs> report. 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 Authorize. Mm -hmm. Or instruct. Great. Connect with Mr. Englander on that. See what the department okay. has to say. Three options. I, saying, I, mean, I mean, if we are, if, I mean, and the other, I mean, the fourth option is be silent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but if we I are thinking mean, that um, we're hearing that this is other, you know, I, I hate going international, but other countries have done it and done it six, um, successfully in the sense that they've saved lives and that it has been a path towards. Um, enter into treatment for some. 
Um, but we're also hearing that there are some, now it's now being explored both um, above board and underground. Um, and we have some, um, I understand we have some research as to their effectiveness, some academic or policy think tank kind of um, research. And so looking at that, if we were going to say, okay, this is something that we'll consider. Okay, sure, option one is no, we're not even gonna to touch it, talk about it. Uh, you know, Option two is we report on it. Option three might be, I mean, this is what I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. option and based on what they testified. Option three would be to authorize municipalities to um, make their own decisions for better word. Um, option four is to instruct the Department of Health. Part of looking at this is they've said the legislature has to do something and they, they pointed out these two options. Is there something else that we would need to do? I mean, you know, my guess is to just say municipalities you can choose. Yeah, no. That may not be enough. Um, I know, <clears throat> yeah. All right. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I, um, I, this is something that I've been really uh, sort of grappling with for a couple of years now, thinking about this as <clears throat> I've heard the city of Burlington, you know, discussing it actually for a while now. Um, and um, I know that we've had fellow legislators bring the concept to us before. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel like before I would go the step of authorizing municipalities or instructing the department to develop rules or that I really would need to have more information okay. about it. Um, I mean, so I, I could see our bill mm -hmm. instructing the department to prepare information or something or to do the research or for somebody. I feel like I need more information before I would, uh, it's a big step. I'm just saying it's a big step. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, am all over harm reduction um, um, as a positive thing for us to, to promote, but it would be a big step for me. I'm just being upfront about that. No, no, I, I appreciate that. And um, I think maybe this would be something that if, if it looked like we wanted to go further, that we would need to have some testimony. Yeah. On, you know, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we would need to have and now, you know, um, yeah, yeah. someone who um, can speak mm -hmm. about it. And also about yep. the liability piece that Carl brought up. Yeah. I'm curious about that. But also, I think Ms. Taylor brought up the uh, possible federal intervention. Uh, we probably need an answer on that. Are there federal regulations that prohibit or have to be set aside? allow this to happen because you're talking about controlled substances which the feds are pretty strong on okay and and you're essentially authorizing the use of these in these facilities so it would seem like you'd have to get some sort of something from the federal government to allow you but i don't know for sure yeah i don't you know i don't know and i mean i don't know any of that and then i'm like oh, we've legalized yeah. Cannabis has the feds. The feds haven't no. legalized cannabis. No. No. I, there's a whole different. I'm not equating mm -hmm. the two, but there is. Um, there's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also an issue around RNs being willing because you take a certain oath when you become a. Is it an oath? I don't remember what it's called, but there are certain things that when you become a physician or a nurse or provider that to that you will do and I think being in the center there's some issue around their licensure and so that I just I don't remember what it was but as Teresa said I've been looking at this and reading articles that come out and wondering how it's working and I remember there were some of the providers were worried about working in this in the center watching something that isn't legal, like how does that work for their license? I mean, I don't remember what that is, but we should probably know that. that they're supposed to do no harm. Yeah. After such with and so. it, it might, I mean, my quick answer would be, 
no one is required. This was we're not suggesting that this they be have part to, of no. um, a. This would be a standalone, its own thing, and um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm, if we even pursue it, if yeah. we pursue it, yeah. So this is on a, a, a relate different good suggestion. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, and if, if somebody said this already and I missed it. Um, uh, I apologize, but one of the things that um, Dr. Um, Seaman also said was that um, what could we do to enable more flexibility in the preferred provider system, mm -hmm. um, how to get to be a preferred provider, what mm -hmm. preferred providers do, um, it says there's no openings right now. I presume that there's a, you know, I don't know, there's some limit that is placed on that, so that's something that, um, feels like we could have an impact on potentially. Okay. Um, like, I'm not, like I'm not, I'm not sure even, I know that we have this thing that we call a preferred provider system and maybe Dane knows the answer to this. I know the designated agencies are in statute, designated agencies are in statute is preferred provider system in statute the way designated agencies are, or is it something that is a construct that we have outside of state law? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I haven't thought about seeing it in statute itself or whether it's just part of the funding system. So um, who, who would be interested, willing to, whether it's connect, connecting with the Department of Health and with start with that and, and Katie around um, the preferred provider network. Okay. And I would also be interested in looking further into um, prior authorization, if that's, unless okay. if somebody else wants to take that. Um, and I also think that um, just checking in with Monica about the, uh, Okay. About the what? I'm sorry. The sunset. Oh, yeah. Okay. I believe she is the deciding factor on that one. So, okay. So we've got that. Um, does anyone want to take the, um, the mobile van? Who suggested the mobile van? Go <laughs> ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> One of them, I don't know who, oh, no, no. In talking <laughs> in, in talking about um, how to increase access to methadone. One there is to sort of look at the hub and spoke model and do we do something different? That seems to be more of a report back kind of thing. Um, and the other, and maybe that Maybe if they didn't say that, did someone here suggest it? No, they suggested no, it. Okay. okay. It's even brought it up. Um, yeah. um, it is to have a mobile van, to um, have a mobile van. Um, and um, did, were you raising your hand? No. No. <laughs> no. But I would yes, he was. That. He was raising, he and Kelly both raised their hands. About okay. the I'm interested in that one. Okay. I feel like in rural places, that is really okay. potentially really helpful. So I'm <clears throat> And so, I mean, I think with that, there's there's a little bit of um, one, how much do, how much would it cost? I mean, you know, the whatever. And can they be connected to syringe? A syringe exchange services. What's the syringe exchange service thing? Like that is uh, the well, the biggest one is Vermont Cares. <laughs> They're an aid service organization, um, and I believe Safe Recovery also has one. So, and so, what becomes confusing? Yeah. Vermont Care and and AIDS Project of Southern Vermont. Okay, it's and two o'clock. All the aid service. <clears throat> okay, it is. We're um, we will get back to this at a later time. Last but um, thank you. Thank you.